good afternoon to everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Transitioning to a Sustainable Food System and Delivering on the SDGs, a Potential of School Meals. Before we start with the official program, I just would like to give you a few information and instructions with regard to how this webinar is run and uh, how to make it possible for you to actively Participant, uh, participate. First of all, the um, webinar is recorded, so I hopefully you're all um, 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 okay with this. By default, your camera and microphone are muted to keep disturbances um, very uh, as little as possible. You all of you are very welcome to um, comment in the chat whatever comes into your mind. Um, also uh, with the entire audience, but of course also between each other, so you, you know it's not the first time you're doing this. However, questions to the speakers and for the questions and answer sessions, they have to be asked under the Q&A um, point there. Um, where it is also possible to like questions from other people to make it more urgent that this question definitely should actually appear also um, in the question and answer session when we are discussing um, the after when we start discussing um, uh, during the round tables, different round tables. So, so far so good. Um, now I would like to welcome you also on behalf of UAGRI because um, UAGRI is also one of the co organizers of this event. My name is Bettina Heimann, and I'm the Secretary General of UAGRI. UAGRI is a network and platform of leading European research institutions in the field of agrofood, but we also have ministers and uh, ministries and research funders among our members. We organize conferences and webinars like this one to exchange on best practices, discuss new research approaches, but also debate apparent dilemmas and trade-offs when um, confronted with this great um, transition process um, we are dealing with um, due to climate change and um, other shocks now, just COVID and now also the war in Ukraine. Therefore, I'm very much looking forward to learn about the potential of school meals as one approach to address the sustainability crisis of our food systems. It is forward-looking, it deals with our kids, I'm also eager to learn about the ongoing research happening in this area, how you integrate different disciplines, include people from outside academia, and eventually what transition passes you see and suggest. So far from me, from you, Abby, now I would like to pass on to um, Philippe Titugain from CIRAT. Um, thank you, Bettina. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great, thanks. I think I have to be very short, and um, I don't want to, uh, to uh, there's another speaker who's maybe to give an uh, element of introduction, but just uh, I would like to say four, four things. The first one is, um, you probably know that Sirat joined uh, Euragri. In fact, when the new charter was, was uh, approved in 2013, because before that there was only one institution per member state in Euragri, but when the door was open, we are very happy to join and to join with our colleague from from INRA, now, now called INRAE. And um, we co-organized with, with INRAE uh, the Euragri annual conference in Montpellier in September 2014. Some of you may remember the torrential rain we had in September 2014 during that conference that sort of spoiled part of the, um, the outings. Anyway, so we are very happy to, to, be, to be part uh, of, of Euragri. Also, because uh, about my second point, I see more and more agri moving from more, let's say, European-centered topics to uh, looking at global challenges, looking at the SDGs, looking at how Europe can contribute to those global challenges. And, and this is typically uh, the case of the topic we have on, on, on today's workshop, uh, looking at uh, uh, food systems, system, how to ensure sustainable, uh, food system, of course, that's related to the UN Food System Summit last year, but also the title, the potential of the school meals, recalls all the effort which has been done on, on with the school meal coalition 
and that's probably something that we'll, you will discuss what's the potential of that school meal coalition, how research can contribute to it. Um, CIRAD has joined the coalition and we are happy to, um, to work with uh, you or the colleagues of the RAGRI to make that coalition uh, a success. Uh, and just to, to conclude and, and to be very brief, um, I just want, I would like to thank the, uh, the co-organizers, um, the uh, UNESCO chair on World Food System, which is co-led by, by CIRAD, uh, in, especially my colleague Nicola Bricas and the Institute Agro. Um, the name of, of Sylvie Avalon must be familiar to some of you. Uh, she is the French contact point for uh, the School Meal Coalition and, and the research part of it. So, and I think she will be uh, participating to this conference. I also would like to, um, to thank the, um, the Finnish partners who have uh, co-organized uh, with CIRAD and with Yoragri this, uh, this uh, workshop and uh, the network um, uh, Eating City, uh, this platform. Um, CIRAD is also a member of, of this platform. So thanks to uh, to all of you for organizing the afternoon and, and maybe a special thank also to my CIRAD colleagues, Sandrine Dury, Ali Daguet, and a few others who have uh, worked with you, Bettina, on putting together this, uh, this very interesting program. Over to you, thank you. Um, and I would like to um, directly uh, pass on um, the word to Donald Bundy. He is a director of research consortium for school meals and nutrition at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, in UK. So please, um, Donald, please take the floor. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Bettina, for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm now going to see if I can share the screen, Let's see if this is working. There we go. Just want to get it to the to the slideshow. There we go. Well, thank you very much for the those introductions, Bettina and uh, Philippe. That's uh, extremely helpful in in setting the scene because I think the you know, one of the key issues when we talk about school health and nutrition, when we talk about school meals, is that there is no one, no one sector that owns this. Although you you would you could hear health, nutrition, education all being mentioned, but of course agriculture is an absolutely basic part of all of this. And I'm so really excited that your Agri and, and CIRAD are are part of of the thinking around this. So thanks for this opportunity. I also want to make the point that this is. This is, not, this is not just an issue about uh, low income settings. This is a worldwide issue for all, in all levels of countries. And, and I think that's uh, gonna come out during the course of the discussion. So I'm gonna talk about the research consortium for school health and nutrition, um, but let me explain where, where that came from, how, how this all started. So if we go back to January 2020, before the pandemic of COVID, the world's school meals programs were as extensive as, a, uh, more extensive than they'd ever been. In fact, this had become the world's largest safety net, according to the World Bank statistics, most, most extensive safety net, with some 400 million children being fed every day, uh, approximately one in two of all enrolled primary school children. And then, as I say, that was in, that was in uh, 2020, 90%, more than 90% of the costs were covered by the countries themselves. This was a domestically funded, uh, very extensive global program. That's January. By April, we all know the story, COVID had arrived, governments everywhere in the world closed their schools and instead of 380 million children being fed we found that 370 million were not fed these are the world food program statistics this was a 10-year decade of growth in expansion of school meals programs suddenly brought to a shuddering halt by by covid and it's that uh, it was that realization 
that made countries suddenly start to pay real attention to providing food through schools, providing care through schools to school-aged children and adolescents. And it led to a real rethinking across the world about how important this age group was and how important schools were in delivering food. And I just want to highlight that uh, through this slide. So, so here we have uh, opinion leaders from Finland and from France, and I mention that because they went on to be the leads in the School Meals Coalition. But I want to highlight by, by saying this, that here we have um, the Minister Skinari from Finland and, and uh, President Macron speaking about these issues, but the same issues are also being raised by President Kigami from Rwanda. And I think this is one of the key messages is that this is indeed a global issue and that it, it is important to people everywhere in the world for the same reasons. And, and President Kigami very specifically said, this was the priority now for the African Union to rebuild, uh, rebuild the programs, to recover the programs. And so at the September UN School uh, Food System Summit, Three goals were identified by a coalition of countries. The first goal was to restore what had been the case in January 2020 by next year, by 2023. Secondly, to reach the most vulnerable children who had not previously been reached, and it's estimated there's about 73 million of those. And thirdly, to focus more on what we, how we invest in school-aged children and adolescents to improve the nutritional quality of the food and improve the food systems. And the countries that came together, some 69, have now signed a, a commitment to those, those goals. And I want to make the point that though that commitment is from countries like France and Finland and the United States, but it's also from Malawi and and Rwanda and uh, Honduras, that this is a global commitment. And that alongside the countries, there's more now than 60 partners, which have also committed to, to support this. Uh, this, as, uh, as, as was mentioned, includes CIRAD, and many of you who are participating today, I hope you will think about also being part of this commitment. And I just want to highlight the fact that Five of the major UN agencies, WHO, UNESCO, UNICEF, FAO, and WFP, the heads of each of those agencies signed a joint declaration in support of this. That's actually a very unusual thing to happen in the, in the UN system, and a great example of how this is a truly multi-sectoral activity that needs, uh, needs a broad range of, of partners to make it and this coalition, in, in thinking about how it, would, uh, how it would operate, the coalition decided they needed certain initiatives to take off. Um, a, the research consortium to, to lead on research, and I'll talk more about that. A financing task force to look at new ways of financing, especially for low-income countries. A peer-to-peer -peer community of practice that's being led from Germany. Um, and now a data and monitoring initiative, because up till now, there has never been a global monitoring of data on school food, uh, on the health of school-aged children. But let's just focus for the, for, for the moment now on the research consortium itself. And again, I just want to emphasize that this, was, this is a, a research consortium set up by the coalition, the School Meals Coalition of Countries. It's a coalition of countries supported by UN agencies, but it's not a UN initiative, it's a country initiative. They have asked for the creation of a research consortium to help provide excellent evidence to support their work. And this is partly asking from um, a global view, and I, I, I mentioned here the, uh, so there's Gordon Brown, um, who with Grasa Marshall is the, is the co-chair of the uh, Global Education Commission, and uh, uh, Minister Skinari representing um, on the, the European side, and also Bibi Giosi, who she and I jointly uh, opened and, and, and launched the research consortium uh, last year. Uh, Bibi is the 
Auda Nepad advisor on, on food and nutrition on homegrown school feeding in the African Union. And it's this kind of partnership that is key to, to this activity moving forward. And what kind of partnership is it that we're, we have in the research consortium? Well, it has an academic home, as, as, as was mentioned, the Secretariat is based in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but this is a global activity. So a small secretariat for a, for a, a global initiative. And it's not about creating a new institution, it's about building a network of those institutions that are already interested. So it's bringing people together. It's about independent evidence, and this is a very important part, point. We speak to the countries, to the member states, we are, we are not responsi responsible to the, the UN system. This is a separate independent group able to look at evidence independently. And we work through policy dialogue, and today this is part of that, uh, that process. And our objectives, what the coalition has asked us to do is really two things. In objective one is to generate evidence on the effectiveness of, of programs and, and in particular making the case for investment. And secondly, to provide that evidence in a way that policymakers for the coalition countries can use to guide their actual programs. So it's research translating into uh, practice that's the key to what this consortium is about. And I want to just make this particular point. What's new about the way we're thinking about this is about the way we think about children as being the school children and the adolescents as being the bridge between early life and adulthood. This is about creating human capital in countries. And our focus is not in the first thousand days, which are vital and which, which are the main target of, of health programs. But in the next 7,000 days that take children from five years of age through to, to their early 20s, how is it we can commit to helping those children grow up and become part of the next generation for their countries? And to do that in a global way. And here's the structure of the research consortium. At the top, we have the coalition, that's the boss. We have a small secretariat, and then we have four for communities of practice. The communities of practice are the key part of how we move forward on this. And I'm going to go into those in a little detail now, but just to say that there are three cross-cutting themes for all of this, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sustainable financing, and cultivating talent for the next, uh, the next generation. So the communities of practice, there are four. The first is called impact and evidence. This is measuring what is the impact of school meals programs in terms of outcomes, education outcomes, um, health outcomes, but also agricultural outcomes. So what's being undertaken here is a new systematic review using the Cochrane process as a global effort. Um, the last time this was done was 2004, so this is well overdue. And this is a this is a process that's uh, already underway and which we'll be reporting back on during the course of this year and inviting you all to take part in in those discussions. The second community of practice is on analytics and metrics, and this is a focus then on value for money of school meals and school health programs. And the issue here is to work with policymakers. We think of these as around the Ministry of finance in particular, to ask the question, what are the returns to these programs? And very crucially, we see these returns as multi-sectoral. So again, health and nutrition obviously are affected, but that has its own impact on education. And that the whole program of school food is based on agriculture. So the agricultural returns are also dramatic. And finally, the returns to social protection. And our estimates at the moment are that for every dollar invested, there's about a nine dollar uh, return, um, uh, uh, taking all of these uh, these together. And we've, we have programs now underway in or about to come underway in six countries, um, but also a global analysis. Thirdly, the third community of practice is about nutrition measurement 
Amazingly, there are no standard and agreed ways of measuring no standard indicators for nutrition in school aged children and adolescents. So there's a program of work looking into this. In fact, all this month, there have been workshops every Friday this month, um, led by NIH with, with other partners, including the research consortium to get into the detail of this. So we're reporting back and you can join those workshops um, every Friday. Um, and then finally, the community of practice that's focusing on good examples of practice. And this is an area where many of you could perhaps have more a more direct engagement with the research consortium. We're looking with the OECD at high income countries. Um, already France and Finland and the United Kingdom are, are part of the contribution to that with, uh, with Canada. Also at large scale problems in China, uh, large scale programs I should say, in China and India and Brazil um, and expanding programs um, across the world. But what we're looking for are partners who are interested in doing case studies about specific countries. We welcome you, it's a call to action if you like, to be part of the research consortium and to help your country to prepare a case study of what its experience has been in providing school meals. Those are the, 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 the broad ideas that we're working with. Um, I, I'm going to finish there because I wanted to leave a few minutes for any questions of clarification that may, uh, may arise from that. The research consortium, is in place, it has a 10 year research agenda. We want you to contribute and be part of that. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you very much, Donald. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit always a little late with my, um, with my muted microphone. I can't see any questions and answers yet, unfortunately in the, um, the question and answer buttons. Um, so I um, would like to, then I will start. I mean, you are asking for case studies, what do I, but you, I'm supposed with all these countries um, having joined you and supporting um, the School Meal Coalition, there must be already um, case studies in place. And um, I mean, we've heard that one, um, one dollar um, investment gives nine dollars uh, in return but i would like if you could um, sort of elaborate a little bit more on um, on the case studies you have available also in different countries or different regions of the world with different um, sort of uh, basis to start from so thank you bettina for that question the it's worth remembering that this coalition started in september last year so it's all this is all very new so so the answer is no we are we aren't we don't have oh. formal case studies at this point mm -hmm. but what i can tell you and which i uh, i i hope some of my colleagues who are on, on this uh, uh, part of this webinar so sylvie um A A avalon and heli kusipalo from finland are both leading on that community of practice um and the way that that's working is that each country that wants to participate is will identify two interlocutors, two leads, if you like, mm -hmm. um, to participate in a global discussion about how best to do this. What's the best kind of what kind of template should we use? Let's let's try and have some uh, some core set of things that are constant, as mm -hmm. well as asking countries to identify what are the you know what are the best things about what they've done, or maybe what's the worst things they have done. But this is a process that's now in the process of, of, de of development. And I think that Sylvie and Ellie will be, uh, maybe during their presentations or, or, or at some other point, be getting back to us all about the detail of how we move forward uh, with, the, with that. Then I've got one question here. Is, uh, um, do you want it only on a national level or would you also, are you also interested in subnational and regional levels? So certainly one of the things that we've found when we've been looking at uh, uh, value for money analyses is you have to look subnationally at some some of the dimensions. I think this is, you know, for all of us who work on on real programs, that's absolutely no surprise that uh, mm -hmm. the that there may be guiding principles that are national, 
but actually the detail the detail really matters so mm -hmm. so yeah i think that, that, that in terms of the uh, the feedback from these uh, from these case studies to be valuable to uh, actual decision makers you need to get into the subnational kind of detail mm -hmm. and i can see heli and, uh, and sylvie nodding their heads in agreement with this so i'm feeling confident <laughs> Okay, so you can't say uh, much more now, because, because I would also imagine it's like with just ordinary schools, you have very well performing schools and it has to do with, with, with people sort of engaging and, and, and the rest of it. So uh, we're just on a national level, um, um, we're not be, but, but how would you, how do you envisage these case studies? Should they be, um, how much money goes into it, how it is built up, what, what do you, uh, consider a case study what do you mean by this so i have so, no idea uh, so i'm going to i'm going to say that maybe maybe we can get heli and selvi to comment on that but i would also like to point out that maurizio has his hand up and maybe we should have a okay uh, i can't see that yeah yeah, um, yeah so if i may Add uh, just something is uh, we are talking about the so called social return of investments, and the Scottish government has made a lot of research. And you have a lot of uh, best case. Uh, I mean, my friend Robin Gourlay should uh, give you, I mean, I think you know him. So I don't know if you've got inside information, Maurizio, because I am Scottish, you know. So this is uh, this is uh, this, this, is look, this looks like a set up question, but I promise you all it's uh, it's an honest question. Um, the, so Maritza is referring to the fact that in the UK, there are separate uh, devolved nations in the UK actually have separate programs and, and Scotland has just rolled out a program that's going to be a universal program. In other words, all children will get free uh, school meals um, or all, all children in primary school initially will get free school meals. And so we, we are certainly, um, we are expecting that there will be a separate case study on that, uh, that particular dimension. And it, it kind of, plays into Bettina your question about uh, um, uh, subnational uh, issues mm -hmm. it's very necessary to uh, to look at the, those details so yeah that's a, a fascinating question on its own so you just mentioned that my maybe Sylvia and Haley um, could comment I'm not quite sure maybe we should would you comment now or would you rather sort of move on to our first round table and take it from there because um, both Sylvia as well as Eli are going to contribute to the first round table. On uh, the first round table is on school meals to improve the nutrition and health status as well as knowledge and skills related to food. So I think we should move on to the first round table then. So uh, Sylvia, the word is yours. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Donna. Sorry. <laughs> it was My pleasure. Quick. Yes, thank you, Donald, for this very enlightening presentation. So I'm Sylvia Vallon. I'm professor of food science and nutrition in the Institut Agro, and I'm also a member of the UNESCO Chair on Food System. And uh, we have built a new network, uh, which is called uh, RESCO, a French network uh, with uh, 50 researchers and uh, lecturers in France who are working on school meals, and uh, we are uh, very happy to contribute to the international uh, um, consortium. Uh, so today I'm going to introduce the first uh, round table. And uh, we, it's true that uh, we know that uh, food contributes to sustainable development, and it also contributes to the overall well-being of human at all stages of life. It brings a pleasure, nutrition, health, and for the particular case of children, it ensures growth, development of cognitive and physical activity, and it contributes to immunity and health. But during the last years, we have seen how school were important in children's well-being and in their food security, and particularly when they are coming from poor families. Uh, but now we know that humanity faces many challenges and it won't be possible to invest in all the areas of sustainable development goals, unfortunately. And it is therefore very important to identify windows of opportunity to achieve the goals we have uh, in the future. And investing in children and school meal could be a window of intervention to improve nutrition, health, knowledge, but also human capital for the future. 
but to do so, we really need to have uh, in mind the feedback of people in charge of school meal program in practice. And we also need to listen to scientists to have their feedback on evidence and limits of such a program. Is it effective to invest in school meals? Which indicator could be improved? Is it child growth, child weight, ch uh, child knowledge on sustainable diet? And to discuss this point, we have identified European researchers to, to talk about uh, this uh, very important topic. So now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome our speakers, Ellie Cusipalo and Dent Herbert Mikkelsen. Ellie is a researcher at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, and she has worked for years on strategy for nutrition and health in European, but also in southern countries. And Bent is a researcher at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He has worked on sustainability of food system in Europe, including at city level, hospital and school level. So now I'm going to, to let uh, Heli present uh, our talk, and I would like you to tell us how school meal can support pupils' learning, nutrition, and health. Please. Thank you. I'm honored to be here today with you, and uh, thank you for the, for the kind words. So <clears throat> Heli would be sharing my screen, um, and uh, um, as, as uh, my topic is here now, how school meal uh, benefits beyond nutrition and health also, we were a bit uh, touching this uh, topic here that I was given, I, I thought uh, uh, to represent Finland's social innovation, because uh, uh, we have seen always the school meals as an investment in effective learning. Next. Uh, and uh, we have a long history, everybody knows, but uh, have heard now about the long history of school meals in Finland. Uh, it's free of charge and each day, each school day, all pupils and students uh, that attend to school are able to have a free of charge meal. And this is quite a big investment in, in our little less than 6 million of inhabitants. A little less than uh, 1 million get every day uh, school meal. Uh, and most of these meals are served in basic education premises. Next one. Um, long story, <laughs> the legal base here, what started actually was the, the compulsory education, which came into effect in 1921. Everybody in Finland had to go to school. And, and then uh, the uh, marriage between food security was done. Uh, actually in 1948 when all children who attended school had uh, were, uh, were uh, entitled to have a warm meal as well. Okay, uh, there was lots of uh, uh, legal uh, approaches to promote the sustainability of the system and the big change came in, in 2004 when school meals were, uh, since when school meals were part of the national school core curriculum. And this gave uh, to the whole system an educational status. Uh, the core curriculum also includes sustaining the well being of pupils, including basic education. Next one. And um, and here are some numbers of uh, important numbers of the history. Actually, the first uh, school meals were very, very basic, very modest soups and porridges and things like that. But, uh, but uh, already in 1960s, meals were uh, already including uh, some vegetables. And, and uh, at that time, it was decided that, uh, that meals should cover approximately one third of the energy requirements per day of each child. Next one. 
so why to provide free of charge school meals? Uh, we have already heard <laughs> why why this is uh, so important. But uh, also, uh, as I said, uh, uh, this was a happy marriage between education and and health, and uh, and uh, it was seen very early. We had uh, wise politicians that time. They they saw it that uh, that uh, without. Uh, 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 without good food, you cannot learn anything. So, also today we see that uh, that meals served at schools are model for nutritionally balanced diet, which helps uh, children to plan also in the future healthy meals. Um, next one, please. So there, are, there is a lot of um, uh, legal approaches, institutional agreements. Uh, there are, uh, there's a huge bustle of all kinds of uh, <clears throat> agreements between various institutes and, and uh, various actors behind the school meal. On, on the top of the pyramid, you, you can see the, the child. We always keep in mind a pupil who, who is going to school and who is choosing what to what to eat in in the school restaurant but um, uh, i have put here also the link of the the eating together the school meal guidelines for <coughs> for for the finnish institutes and and it includes actually uh, eating and learning together includes many approaches that you can see here. A school meal has to be safe, it has to be a supervised situation, it meal itself should be appealing, uh, nutritionally balanced and uh, appropriate. Also, uh, as I was saying already before, free of charge and uh, sustainability has come. Uh, a crucial thing today here. Next one, please. Here you can see the administrative responsibilities. It was already mentioned that one, one uh, ministry alone cannot work here, but a, a leading role in providing um, school meals in Finland has been in, in the Ministry of Education and Culture. And uh, also our food ministry in Finland is uh, uh, that of agriculture and forestry. And uh, the nutritional uh, uh, points of view uh, come from Ministry of Social Affairs and Health. And uh, of course, Ministry of Finance is very important. Uh, there comes the tax, taxation money <laughs> or partly uh, also to the, to the school meals. Uh, more uh, important all the time is coming the sustainability and Ministry of Environment is, is um, looking the food systems uh, environmentally uh, health and uh, Minna will tell more about this. Next one, please. So uh, it has been al already mentioned why to provide free school meals. They serve as, a, as an investment uh, for the lifelong effects uh, of a child. Next one, please. Um, uh, here, here, we, here I wanted to mention that, um, that in Finland, the municipalities, towns and cities, they are very very independent in many ways, but they they need to provide meals. They need to run the schools and they need to provide the meals in Finland. And uh, these expenses are covered by taxation and, and the financial and practical resources differ between municipalities. So it is uh, up to policy decision makers how much money they invest for the school meals. Uh, now, what we are talking about currently is that there should be also um, healthy snacks served at schools because many, many children are staying long days at schools. Next one, please. Uh, <clears throat> uh, guided uh, um, 
guidelines for the school meals include that the, the lunch time should be uh, between 11 and 12 and enough there should be enough time to eat and and also that uh, that the school restaurant should be a nice place to stay and there should be uh, it's a recreation moment uh, during the long school day and uh, uh, in ideal world uh, teachers should attend and discuss with the children also there during the meal times next one please Nutritional criteria for meals is that uh, uh, the, we, we one third of the energy requirements, but the, the meals should not continue excessive amounts, uh, uh, neither fats or, or salts, and, and also um, uh, we have now set the, the target that there should be fish in, in main course at least once a week and that the menus shouldn't be every day the same but the change in six weeks intervals. Next one please. And <clears throat> here you can see a tray of a Finnish school meal. It includes the main course, there is bread and uh, there are some um, uh, margarine as bread spread. Uh, there is something to drink, and uh, there is uh, there are some fresh uh, fruits or or uh, vegetables also, and uh, with the salad uh, always uh, vegetable oil based dressing. Next one, please. Um, so we have been studying how how people eat uh, and uh, here are some some uh, uh, results from our studies which are just uh, done so that we have asked uh, children to uh, to answer in in the questions they are uh, they are the children's impressions next one please so uh, kids in Finland, uh, even though we had thought that they, they have opportunity to all these beautiful and balanced foods, they, the meals are not consumed 100% what we hope, but, uh, but there is difference uh, between um, various school types. Next one, please. And uh, even uh, all parts of the meal are, meals are not eaten. So most popular part is the main course and and uh, and uh, fresh vegetables. But depending who you ask. Next one, please. Uh, also during school day, children eat something else besides uh, lunch and. Uh, they tend to bring bring the snacks or go to the next door supermarkets to buy something. So that is something. It's not enough to have uh, have a lunch, but something else is needed. Next one, please. Uh, also, energy drinks are consumed uh, in quite uh, in abundance, uh, in especially in vocational schools. Boys tend to consume lots of energy drinks during the school school days as well. Next one. <clears throat> so, uh, when we asked why why uh, kids are not eating the school meals, so so it was associated uh, with with unhealthy lifestyle, and uh, and. Uh, uh, not generally not liking the school or being bullied at school. So, so this is uh, an important social finding why, why not to, to eat at schools. And also overweight children tended not to, to go at all into the school restaurants. Next one, please. So we have had a school without candy projects. Next one, please, I, I will uh, hurry. We have a recommendation concerning vending machines, uh, machines in schools. We want to limit uh, 
vending of uh, unhealthy foods, uh, soft drinks, sweets, and etc., and uh, and uh, tends to promote uh, the sales of the the healthy snacks, for instance. Next one, please. So future challenges concerning school lunches. Uh, we should encourage those people who have unhealthy habits to participate lunch uh, in the school lunches and encourage children to eat all parts of the meal. This, uh, this should be maybe uh, done in it to be more attractive and, uh, and also, as I said, providing more healthy snacks in every schools in every school day. Next one, please. Uh, we, it is uh, amazing that we have been running uh, the school meal system in Finland for more than 70 years, but we still haven't collected and follow up data on the nutrition of Finnish children and adolescents. We don't know very well what they are actually eating. And uh, we have um, separate uh, uh, case studies, but, but not the follow-up of the whole system. So this is one of the <laughs> biggest challenges also in Finland, if, if in the whole world, as uh, Pro Professor Bundy <laughs> mentioned. Uh, and we should in increase, of course, the consumption of the healthy, healthy foods. Next one, please. So conclusion <coughs> and, uh, is, is to say that free school meals and well-organized catering systems offer unique potential for improving the dietary habits. For, for children and also as they learn for the rest of their life. Um, uh, and we see that adequate financial resources for school meals is a good investment for whole public health, but, uh, but we also need more evidence-based data on this. Um, school food system and sustainable policies have a greatest impact on future of pupils and and this is something that we are we are going to do in Finland in the future. Um, next one. Um, the I just wanted to mention in the end that uh, that uh, uh, we have the guidelines and tools uh, that that could create the healthy food environment, but uh, but uh, as uh, these innovations need to be implemented and implementation needs to be followed up. So it's quite a puzzle to, <laughs> to uh, also give the evidence-based uh, recommendations and guidelines to the politicians. Maybe I stop here <laughs> to give uh, floor to, to others. There are some some more information in, in my dia, uh, dia show, but you, you will uh, get it, <laughs> everybody who, who wants. To. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation and very interesting uh, insight. Uh, um, well, I, I have two questions from my side and I've seen uh, four questions in the Q&A. So may I ask uh, first, um, I would like to have information about the the free access to the meals. You told us that uh, it was taken in charge by the cities um, and, yes. and of, of the country, but uh, it was based, uh, according to what you say, on taxation also. So could yes. you tell us more uh, which kind uh, of taxation are you speaking about? Because here in France, when we want to create a new tax, it's always very not uh, accepted by the population. So what is your... Uh, the, yes. uh, Yes, in your case. So, so or, organizing uh, the school, the education system in Finland is uh, in charge of the cities, uh, the municipalities always. And, and uh, what happens in, in the, <clears throat> and, and money comes from uh, taxation of the, of the cities also. Oh, okay. We have two kinds of taxation system. We, we also pay for 
something for the state and and part of the tax money that we pay goes to the cities so to say it, okay. to put it briefly <laughs> okay and uh, my second question is also concerning the global uh, nutritional status of uh, children who are going to school. Do you have an idea of the prevalences of uh, overweight, obesity, or wasting, or other mm. kind of uh, nutritional disorder, for example? And did you take this into account when you have uh, chosen uh, to target and develop specific uh, meals at school? Yes, uh, or originally it was uh, <laughs> really to to um, combat hunger in in the beginning, and and uh, but later on uh, also to to see uh, to develop the healthy growth, to put it that way, and healthy growth you can uh, always um, measure in different ways. Um, currently in the projects uh, um, that I have been uh, working with in Global South, the, the basic thing is to, to measure the growth. Then you can also tell a lot of other things from, from that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And so in the Q&A, we had a question, for example, uh, from France. Uh, from Anthony Fardé, who was uh, noticing that uh, in the picture you showed us uh, about the meals in school, uh, sometimes we can see ultra-processed food with uh, margarine or plant milks, for example. And uh, do you take uh, into account the level of processing of the food uh, that are served to, to children? Yes, uh, this is a very good question to the nutritionist because uh, uh, I think the nutrition <laughs> nutrition world is not has not agreed with uh, what do we mean with ultra processed foods because sometimes we really need to process some foods. But um, uh, to answer, I understand you asked about the margarine. Uh, we we see margarine containing healthy healthy uh, fatty acids, um, uh, un unsaturated fatty acids. And uh, in Finland, uh, the margarines uh, almost have no, um, no other um, hard fats uh, that they used to have before. So we consider margarines to be healthy, healthy ah, okay. food. Okay, it depends of the uh, context. <laughs> it depends of the context, yes. Okay. Another question from, from Anna Essex, who is asking, uh, and what about red meat uh, to ensure uh, high quality of protein and uh, sufficient uh, iron intake? How many times per week uh, do you serve meat? Uh, in in school menus there is currently once a week uh, uh, red meat once a, uh, or two two times a, in a week uh, uh, fish and then then we are all also now um, having many new uh, plant based protein uh, sources and. Uh, of course, those are also processed foods, but but they are healthy and and um, iron is not a big thing. Uh, it it comes uh, from other other things. What why we have milk in in Finnish uh, school meal tray is uh, that uh, that uh, the uh, cr most critical nutrient is vitamin D in Finland, and and we uh, fortify milks with vitamin D and, and people drink milk <laughs> mm. uh, or, or plant-based uh, uh, drinks that are fortified also okay. at schools. Another comment, um, I see that Boris, Boris is asking also if uh, you have worked with school gardeners and uh, growing uh, food with children, for example, in, uh, in the Finnish uh, example, is it uh, also used? Um, uh, some, uh, some schools um, have uh, their own uh, gardens, and, um, but uh, as you know, we have very hard winter in Finland. Uh, 
uh, many schools um, uh, at, uh, are organizing so that in summer times there there are uh, camps uh, where <laughs> children can participate and learn how to grow healthy foods. Uh, but uh, yes, there are examples, ga example gardens, and I I think they are very important also. And and now we have ha we have been having in in uh, some uh, early education centers, uh, small boxes where, where the children can grow, where they can uh, put uh, like uh, uh, some herbs into their foods and, and uh, add uh, the greens uh, on their foods and, and learn to, to eat uh, more varied food. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is also a lot of comments in the Q&A, but uh, I think it's time to move on to the second uh, uh, presentation. Just uh, Chiara Falvo is asking, how is it possible to use indicators and tools, tools with a wider vision, taking into account the social, uh, economical value, etc., of school meals? But we will discuss that point in the next round table. So Chiara, you, we will ask you just a little later. And now, so we are going to thank you very early. You stay with us because we will have again uh, some questions at the end. And now I'm going to give the floor to Ben for his uh, presentation uh, with a global approach of school meal. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um... Thanks a lot for inviting me here uh, to speak about this um, important topic about how can we <clears throat> improve the eating habits of um, of young people. Um, I think it's um, probably you. Let me just unshare. Seems that you uh, probably would have to use your the ones that you already got. Let me see. Is that possible? You want me to display your presentation, Vent? Yeah, do that because this apparently is not working. All right, let's um, let's use the the low tech version. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for inviting me. I think it's really a pleasure for me to speak about this um, uh, this work on how we can uh, policies and research to improve the eating habits of of young people. So um, at the point of departure I'm going to take, and uh, also the uh, probably the reason why I was invited to, to do this is that we did a review on the evidence on what is the impact of, of school meal interventions. And, um, and probably you know that reviews are, is what you, do, what, what you and the research community start to do uh, when numbers of, of intervention studies increase. And then suddenly people would be asking, and, and, and at least the politicians would be asking, what is the bigger picture? If we look at intervention studies in a transversal manner, what is then the bigger picture? Does School meal intervention leads to uh, to healthier eating, so that's the purpose of of um, of most uh, reviews. And um, I would like to say that normally when I do uh, my lecture on uh, on this particular review, it, it takes about forty five minutes. We don't have that time uh, today, so uh, it's going to be a very quick um, walkthrough. I would also like to say that although my my review or our review is focusing on healthy eating as such, I think there's a it's important to underline that there's a close link between what we speak about uh, about individual health and planetary health and also there's a close link between what you are serving like in the school food canteen and what takes place in the uh, in the, in the classroom and i think already we heard some good examples of what is the link between the practice 
and education. So next slide, please. And next slide, please, again. <clears throat> so um, I think um, it's fair to say that we have seen a dramatic uh, uh, increase in the interest, interest. If you look on the left side, this is from PubMed. If you search for school meal intervention studies, you will see a dramatic increase over the past 15, 20 years. A lot of studies across the world has been done trying to investigate this question on is there an, a relation between serving healthy food and uh, some well-defined um, health outcomes and uh, and uh, eating outcomes and also on the left side you see the recently uh, uh, funded uh, school food for change i know that other speakers would be speaking about that so uh, so uh, no need to go in details with that um, but it all points into the direction of um, the increasing agreement about, among polit polit policymakers and among uh, yeah policymakers that if we want to do something, then there's not a lot we can do, but we can at least agree on on taking action at school. Next slide, please. So uh, and just a, a word of a caution because and now so far we've been hearing about. Um, um, well, let me start another uh, another place. We have 45 uh, countries in, in, in Europe, and uh, we probably, I would say, have 45 different school meal cultures. Um, I'm not going to deal with that in, 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 in detail, but I'm going to show you three categories, and I think it's fair to say we can put Finland, Sweden, uh, Estonia here in the, on the left side, and we can put my own country. I have to disclose the fact <laughs> I'm living in Sweden, but I'm working in Denmark. So I know both uh, school uh, meal cultures. So we can put Denmark here in the non-collective approach, which is totally family-based, household-based, lunchbox-based, and market-based. So it's totally up to the free initiative, no tax paid meals, no nothing. So I just think it's very important to, to keep in mind that we have a huge difference in school meal cultures across Europe. And then, um, let me uh, next slide please yeah well uh, could i take just <laughs> could i take the the liberty of, of of a small joke because i read this uh, un food yeah uh, un uh, uh, un measurement of happiness in countries so could we ask the question is there a close relation between having a, a, a golden standard school meal program and being happy no because finland come in as you can see First place, Denmark come in as a, as a second place. So, um, but as I said, that was a joke. Next slide, please. Um, what we are trying to do in, in, in the review is basically to answer this research question. Can school meals contribute to improving the nutrition and the health status as well as knowledge and skills? And we can consider knowledge and skills as, as, as good determinants of Good eating and also uh, good eating is a determinant for health status. So that's basically, basically healthy eating here and anthropometry um, here on the, left, on the left side. So that's the research question that um, these kind of reviews are trying to answer and also have to, to acknowledge the fact that we have been doing a review and that's if you if you if you measure the number of intervention studies, um, school, school meal intervention programs, it's huge. It's about two hundred something like that, and the number of reviews is uh, also increasing. So what we did is pretty much uh, the same as other researchers are doing. They are basically trying to look across transversally, transversally, and get the big picture on um, does. Um, our school meal programs, a good uh, public health nutrition investment. So what these studies are doing is that they are looking, they're running over time, could be one month, two months, could even be two years. They're doing a baseline, they're doing a follow-up. And, and what they try to do then is to measure some well-defined outcome measures, which could be uh, proxies or indicators of healthy eating, or it could be anthropometry. So what that would be BMI. Um, sometimes studies are also uh, studying or examining what is the dietary knowledge, um, which, as I said, could be a determinant for these two other things. So 
Um, so basically, the st intervention studies are trying to and expecting, of course, that if you serve healthy food for kids, then, of course, you should be able to uh, measure some kind of income or outcome. That's not always the case, but that's the speculation you do or you have when you're doing intervention studies. So that's the basic recipe. And then here on the left side, of course, it's important to, to know uh, what kind of... Um, what kind of uh, intervention components are you doing? Are you doing simply a, what I call a food service intervention, which is serving healthier meals compared to not serving those kind of meals? So that's the very simple intervention component. But most of the intervention studies we are looking at is also including some kind, obviously or naturally, that's a good, good reason to, to say, well, it's only it, it is only one third of the energy you are it's, um, you are uh, accounting for in the school. So why not include a community, a fam family intervention component? So a lot of studies are also trying to do something at home. Some of them are also trying to do a behavioral modification uh, component, and some of them are also trying to involve a nutrition education component. So what we see in the world of intervention studies, school meal intervention program studies, we see uh, single components or multi-component studies. And I think it's fair to say that you could speculate uh, beforehand that doing many things at the same time probably would lead to more impact than just doing one thing. Next slide, please. And next slide, I think we can skip that. Yeah. So, what you do, and this is actually from the first inter uh, review that we did more than 15, uh, 12 years ago, is basically you try to identify what's out there, what are the intervention studies. Um, uh, some, most of them would have some kind of an acronym. You would try to find out, okay, what was the focus of that particular intervention study and in what country was it, um, <clears throat> was it carried out? Next slide, please. And then, once you want to rate, once you want to score, once you want to compare across the world of intervention studies, you need some kind of what is normally referred to as a healthy eating in index, HEI, which is an attempt um, to, 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 to convert a very complex dietary eating pattern into one single figure. So that's the idea of uh, healthy eating indices. And you see an example here. You look at what are the intake of vegetables, fruits, nuts, and the ratio of white to red meat. So there are different attempts to do that or different proposals to do that. But all intervention studies are more or less trying to do the same thing to uh, end up with a single score that is expressing how, health, how he healthy are you eating. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is our review study that was done with my good colleagues, Sabina and Francisek. Thanks to those. Um, and um, next slide, please. What we did was uh, 42 um, studies that was uh, published uh, recently uh, within the past 10 years. And then once you want to do reviews, you need to have an impression or you need to have a uh, a figure. You need to have a score on saying what is the strength of that particular design because school intervention studies comes in different uh, designs. Some are what we call pre-test, post-test without any comparison and the golden standard would be what we call a randomized controlled cluster trial uh, that we would assign uh, more power to compared to the uh, pre-test, post-test approach. Next slide, please. And then you start uh, the hard work, which is basically, here's the unit of analysis. This is one uh, intervention studies, and here comes the other one. So you would simply start to put them in into a giant, a giant Excel sheet. That's the, the whole idea. And then you will start uh, characterizing those intervention studies and say, well, how many, what was the duration of the intervention? What kind of age group did we have? You would try to standardize that. And what was the outcome measures? You would distinguish between health status and sobriety. And um, 
indicators of um, what happened there and indicators of uh, healthy eating, as I said, HEI, or it could be in the simplest case, you are just counting uh, numbers of uh, fruit and vegetables. Nutritional knowledge could be, as I said, an outcome measure attitude, and then you would start um, comparing and you would sign a score, and then you would try to find the patterns in your material. Next slide, please. And in any review, you would start with a huge number, uh, in this case, uh, over 1,000, and then you will end up with a study sample, which in our case was 42 years. So this is just standard review methodology. Next slide, please. And let's look at some uh, take-home uh, messages. What we find in general, I think that's fair to say that looking at our review, comparing with other studies, other reviews in general, intervening in the school setting, uh, has an impact. And what we find in our cases in particular, that school meal interventions seem to work better among the youngest, which I think could be explained by the fact that, that young people um, in early school maybe are more prone to listening to nutritional advice. Uh, they're doing what they're told and these kind of things. You all know that compared to teenagers, um, these are probably more uh, difficult to control. Um, so generally speaking, school meal interventions can improve process of healthy eating, the HEI. School meal, meal interventions only in few cases changes and primarily you find that in some cases that BMI is, is changing, but the mechanism or the development of a, a changed BMI is, as you know, a thing that takes very long time. Normally these intervention studies are between half a year, maybe in some cases one year, but in very few and rare cases, uh, more than one year. So, um, and, uh, and we don't find that particular significant impact in our sample, but I think it's fair to say that looking across many studies, there is a potential of uh, school meal programs to make change and it's dependent on the bandwidth. <clears throat> in other words, multi-component, multi-level uh, interventions work better, th better than single um, component interventions. The more you do, the greater effect. Um, and the uh, school meal programs intervention needs to include environmental components. And by the way, we were speaking, and, and I think that point has been touched upon uh, earlier, not only do they have the potential to uh, in, uh, improve a uh, process of healthy eating, they also have the potential to um, create better learning capacity, academic achievement, th these things. And, uh, and, and there's uh, quite good evidence on, on that fact. And I think that um, I'm very happy that was, was mentioned by Haley in, in the Finnish approach that serving good food makes you be a better learner. Next slide, please. So, um, and then, as I said, I think it's important. I'm a strong advocate of a sort of a holistic approach to say, and that's why I use in particular the idea of a whole school approach. And what I try to list here on the left side and on the right side, on the left side, you have sort of the practicalities. These are all the servings. These are the, the, the concrete meals that you serve in school meal programs in school food scheme, in school meal scheme, in breakfast clubs, whatever. These, this is the availability on the left side. On the right side you have, which I think uh, is extremely important, uh, is all the curricular classroom activities that you can do, that you can think about. Well, canteen is only part of the school. What is most important in many schools or uh, just as, as, as equally important as the canteen is the classroom. And maybe I should uh, admit that what I'm, what, what I'm saying this is that in Denmark, as I said, we don't have any uh, publicly provided uh, school food. So, so we have uh, been having a, a really good study case to see, well, if we don't have the provision, then what else can we do? And that else, what we can do is basically taking place in the classroom. So canteen and classroom, practice and learning. Um, next slide, please. So how could that uh, look like? And I could probably show you a lot of different cases. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you one case, which is the CSAM food education 
research project that we did that we are doing uh, been doing for now two years in a row for the uh, EU Commission six schools 300 pupils 20 teachers three months of preparation out of class project based learning so out of curricula or traditional subjects into project based learning construct build design engineer using what we are calling or referring to as a STEM uh, or STEAM approach, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, including home economics and math. Targeting what we are referring to as the 21st century skills, which is critical thinking, teamwork uh, abilities, uh, digital insights, all these kinds of things that, that is believed to be important for uh, the future generation. Next slide, please. And I want to show you three examples of that. Uh, engineering and indoor educational farm. Next slide, please. Building and aquaponics vertical farm. And as you can see here, there's a lot of sort of digital components here, measuring different things, reading biosignals, all these kinds of things that can be integrated in STEM teaching. And the last slide, please. Coding the farm but so making a robot work in order to do a raised bed growing and being able to program it so that it works the way you want it to work. And um, next slide, which I believe, I think, yeah. So the point I'm trying to make here is that as I, I spoke a bit about the link between provision uh, practice and education. Also spoke about the link between with uh, healthy eating, which is of course uh, important for the individual, but there's also a thing, not called individual health, but planetary health, which is all the sustainability things that probably also was illustrated in my uh, three pictures. So asking the question, can we think about youth pupils at school as co-creators of tomorrow's food system, including of course, they should be healthier, how can we give young people at school the tools, methods, knowledge, skills, and capacities that will enable them to influence, change, and design better and more just future food systems? That's the whole idea of a sort of an empowerment and educational approach um, that we uh, have been studying in Denmark. And as I said, we don't have a lot in, in Denmark in particular when it comes to school food provision, but what we do have is sort of a um, strong tradition in, in doing educational research. So um, with these words, I want to go to my, I think the last slide, which is coming here. Yeah. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to uh, answer any question. Uh, and I also wa want to extend uh, invitation to this education for food sustainability and nutrition, um, which is coming up in Copenhagen in early May as part of the World Food Summit. It's called Generation Climate, Empowering Young People for Future Food Systems Transformation. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Ben, for your presentation. Um, I don't know if there is some question. I don't believe in the Q&A for the moment. I have one, um, one to ask. You have uh, mentioned in your literature review that you have seen an impact of these uh, school meal programs on anthropometry, but uh, could you give us more details? Uh, was it um, improving, for example, the, the prevalence of the overweight or is it, uh, was, was it better yeah. for growth of children? Do you have more detail? Yeah, I would say, I'm, I mean, taking it again, the transversal view and looking at more studies and looking at more reviews, I think that what you find normally is, uh, is uh, improving indicators of healthy eating. That's what you do mm -hmm. looking at the health status, which is what you are asking for, the anthropometry. Um, that's uh, that's uh, quite, I would say, limited evidence because, and there's a reason for that, because what you do at school is only, I think that somebody mentioned the impact, I think it was Heli, uh, one third of the energy intake, one third of what you're eating as a kid comes from school. Then there's a market scape, there's a family scape, there's a, uh, what do I know, a retail store scape, a catering scape, a food service scape. There's a lot of other influences. And even there's a social media scape 
that is influencing young people to eat. So what I'm trying to say is that the school only controlled one third of nutritional impact. And that's probably why, at least that's my explanation to why you don't find a, a more impact when you look at anthropometry and the etiology of, uh, of, of BMI, obesity and overweight, I would argue is probably a thing that develops over one, two, three, four, five years eating unhealthy. It takes a lot, lot long time. And that's at least again, my explanation to why don't you see a lot of evidence on the fact that school meal pro uh, programs and school meal interventions can change into primary. Mm. I hope that was an answer. Okay. Yes, because I have seen uh, one paper in Poland who they were saying that uh, school meals program had a, a protective effect uh, on overweight, but maybe it's just in one context and uh, we cannot generalize the, the point. I would have my my anxiety that you cannot generalize um, yes. from mm. from from a, from a few few studies. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see more questions in the Q and A, but uh, I, I see that Donald Bundy would like to make a comment, and we have also Stefan Verge, who is from the the Public Health School of uh, Harvard, who would like to to make a, a contribution. So Donald first. Thank you very much, and uh, congratulations, uh, Bent, on the on that great presentation. Um, I just want to really make a comment on the uh, on the anthropometry side because part part of the the problem is, and and Ellie gave a great example of this that that we've not been measuring these things very consistently uh, anywhere in the world, even in even in countries like Finland that have been really focusing on this area for so long. And that's not done. So, so most of the data are relatively, uh, relatively recent. Mm. And so, I just wanted to say that the, you know, the studies that are now coming out in, in uh, particularly in the states, the, the I'm thinking of the Shape Up Somerville uh, study mm. that that's a, a, a randomized controlled trial design in in, in essence, um, and it's asking the question: Can you tell a benefit from exactly the kind of very complex mixture of interventions that you're recommending? versus versus not doing not doing all of those things can you see a difference in the trajectory of the children so it's not looking following individual children in this case comparing children with different experiences and you do see it very clearly in those in those studies that that you can indeed have a big impact on on ob obesity over over time but it's not going to it doesn't show up in the individual if you if if, if you take my point the individuals yeah. The individual trajectories are what have been changed. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think as a standard uh, answer from a researcher, uh, researcher would be more resources needed. I think, I, I know it's banal to say, but I think there's a lot of potentials in improving the methodology. And I think that you also raised that point. And I think also Heli raised that point that there is a need for standard methodologies to measure impact because there's so many studies so there needs to be common methodologies, agreed methodologies for measuring the impl impact, including, I think, the uh, anthropometry. And also, maybe I, I would like being uh, living in, in Sweden, I, I want to flash this uh, Swedish studies that was done by uh, Daniel Roth and, and his co-workers that was, was taken uh, 20 years, I think uh, 20 or 30 years, recently published yet, last year. Um, actually uh, concluding that, that, that kids in Sweden that ate school meal, they were earning more, they were getting taller, and they were, I don't recall the last outcome, but there were some really, really interesting long-term impacts of, um, of uh, school meal program interventions. Thank you. Stefan, maybe you would like to, to add something? I don't know, yes. Hello, can you hear me? And I'm trying to yes. put my camera on. Uh, yes, can you see me as well? Yes. Sorry for taking time. Uh, thank you, Sylvie, for uh, inv uh, inviting me to give uh, brief remarks um, uh, to this presentation's excellent work here. What I wanted to take in, in a couple of minutes, I'll try to be brief, is to give a economics point of view on all this uh, value for money uh, um, of school meals thinking. 
And uh, what I want to say is, and I have a couple of remarks really. One is that really here is we have a unique opportunity for effective impact, uh, improved health status, increases educational attainment. In the meantime, um, increasing uh, education levels, improve uh, health status, health interventions, uh, and there was a lot of emphasis here by Ellie and Bent about deliveries, which was, uh, I thought, uh, uh, very exciting, can be delivered and reach millions of recipients. And then, as Ellie said in her presentation, especially with shaping long-term habits, we really have a long-term uh, impact here potentially because we act uh, during a window of time where uh, uh, adolescents shape long-term habits. And I'm thinking about preventing a lot of uh, economic costs, for instance, related to uh, NCDs and, and so on. Uh, so in fact, uh, when we think, and I know that's gonna be something uh, that, uh, in fact, Ellie really highlighted well, I thought it was very interesting in Finland, the inter-collaborations with different administrative responsibilities and, 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 and government uh, bodies. And I know it's in some extent is gonna be also uh, commented in the next panel. Uh, we really have to think about multi-sectoral impact of school meals. Obviously there's an impact on education, there's an impact and, and great discussions here that we've had about uh, uh, better dietary intakes, healthy behaviors, some of the things that Bent uh, touched upon. And also very importantly, I know there was a few exchanges in the chats, how we think about this in terms of social protection, uh, how we can avert poverty, and very importantly, uh, how we can potentially uh, grow a, a local uh, agricultural economy. And that, there's a lot to play with local communities involvement, uh, producing good school meals, and then potentially the idea that maybe we could raise uh, uh, or develop uh, farming employments uh, uh, and, and, and so on. And of course, there's an environmental impact that uh, that's going to be discussed in the next panel. Um, and so then, in essence, and uh, is what we need to do, and I think there's a lot of potential uh, synergies between collectively all our work is really to think about best buys and, and best practices. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Sylvie, for instance, as part of the uh, uh, School uh, Health and Nutrition Research Consortium is leading a committee of practice, uh, uh, co-leading a committee of practice. Um, uh, around this is we have to think about how we think about, in fact, uh, Ben was talking about the different delivery mechanisms, collective, non-collective, and I'd love to discuss that more with you, Ben. Uh, but we need to think about school meals and uh, school feeding programs. They have a delivery cost. And then we need to think about casting our advancements in terms of multidimensional returns. Uh, obviously, health, nutrition, burden of disease averted. We've had a discussion about this, education but also social protection and uh, uh, you know, returns on developing local food systems. And very importantly, um, um, there's a potentially huge equity impact that was very well emphasized by Ellie uh, in her uh, uh, free school me provision uh, point and obviously also uh, evidently um, a, a, a significant gender impact. And then lastly, uh, I'll just uh, wrap up and saying that uh, as part of the uh, uh, research consumption, consumption that Don as, as, uh, as clearly uh, and brilliantly highlighted in his presentation, we have an analytics and metrics community of practice where we're really thinking about conceptualizing all these indicators that you've been discussing and how we think about value for money of school meals programs and currently we're embarking on, on really exciting projects uh, uh, according um, uh, in a number of countries with uh, uh, involvement of, of uh, partners, strong collaborations with national programs, uh, the African Union, the Southern African Development Community and ECOWAS uh, uh, to really think about uh, national uh, analysis as well as regional. And we would really like to uh, learn from um, from the different experiences that uh, are being shared today. Thank you and sorry to, to be a bit rushy, but uh, thank you for giving me your time and please be in touch. Thank you, it's a good uh, transition for the next uh, round table and uh, maybe Stéphane, if people uh, are interested, uh, they can join or call you for the, the value for money uh, community of practice. So, now we are going to move on uh, the, to the second uh, table. 
with uh, Maurizio Mariani, who will uh, uh, manage and uh, monitor the, the next session. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Just I share my screen. Okay. So this is the second part, round tables, school meal as a lever to promote food system and sustainability, environmental and economic dimension, territorial and development on social cultural education. Uh, I think that's all of us as researchers and, 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 and stakeholders in a more general sense, we, we should be aware of the economics of this field and, and not only maybe on, on school meal, but also for elderly house and uh, what we call the, the social food service market uh, uh, in Europe and worldwide. Just because, I mean, to get the attention of decision maker and politician, we really need to uh, highlight uh, the numbers, the uh, capacity of, of human, of, of a worker, of producing uh, new jobs if we should shift uh, the, the paradigm of, the, of, this, uh, of this field, of this sector. Uh, First, I mean, just some, some uh, definition of uh, what food service or catering industry is. I mean, it's those business that uh, uh, is managing uh, any meal uh, prepared outside of home. It's what we call uh, uh, out of home consumption. Uh, this sector includes uh, restaurant and cafeteria and catering operation. One of the main problems we have in Europe to collect data about this uh, on economics is that uh, the NACE code, the code of activity we use in the European nomenclature, it's, uh, it's mixed with other uh, uh, sectors. So, and also uh, we have a lot of uh, municipality and, and institution uh, and local authorities that they are buying only ingredients and this escape from the service analysis. So that's uh, the modern food system is a really a, a complex web. Uh, we will see in, in my short presentation some uh, data about the Italian market and the European value of this field. And uh, uh, I mean, but the problem is that in the last 20 years, really, we assist to a, a sort of a industrialization and globalization trends, uh, triggering uh, uh, the out and, and forced uh, many companies outsourcing of food production in, in country with uh, lower labor and energy cost. And that's despite uh, uh, food sovereignty and as we experience uh, in, in, uh, during pandemic and food resilience, that is one of the, the key words. Um, this uh, was th this uh, uh, globalization has two direct uh, negative results, the rising unemployment in many countries and increase the greenhouse gas emission due to the greater distance of food transportation, the so-called food miles. Our food system has been experienced really a deep transformation uh, during these last uh, two decades, I should say. Uh, health expert, and, and that's before me, there was someone, uh, warned that the increasing popularity of, uh, of industrially made food will lead to negative effect. Uh, we, we have some trajectory. We know that uh, uh, processed food uh, and ultra processed food are not really the best recipe for our daily food. Uh, of course, we need to investigate more. Uh, the food service market is split into two, two distinct groups, I uh, mean, two clusters, I should say, uh, especially the school meal. Uh, it's contracted, so where the local authority, the municipality, the city is managing uh, uh, with uh, a tender, so there is a private company that is managing the service, and the self-operated. That's it's around uh, uh, the self-operated market, it's, uh, it's uh, like 70%. Uh, in, in uh, sorry, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, half half depend from the country in France is 70 30 in Italy 60 40 but it's, we should say in Italy it's uh, it's like uh, uh, 30 percent uh, uh, of of uh, of uh, uh, driven by private entities I should say and 70 percent driven by uh, uh, local authorities or hospital that's uh, the, the the entire food service market. Uh, that's, this is an analysis that we, we do and uh, we continue to do from almost 20 years. That's the, uh, the first slide is regarding the dimension of the food and beverage industry in Europe. And I highlight two uh, indicators uh, very shortly. Uh, 341,000 uh, euro per worker is the productivity ratio in large company and 112, so three times less in small uh, in micro enterprise, I should say, zero from zero to 19 workers. 
that's uh, uh, and the food service uh, consumption, uh, the, the, the out of home consumption, sorry, it's estimated at uh, 409 uh, a billion euro and the public food service inside this big uh, uh, family, it's 81 billion uh, euro per year. That's is the estimated value of, uh, of the public food service in Europe. And where uh, self-operated, uh, it should be around uh, 54 uh, uh, billion. A public food service is buying around 24 billion euro of, of, of food ingredients, processed or unprocessed food. And if we will be able to shift procurement into 100% local and from small producer, we should contribute to create really some of uh, 200,000 jobs in Europe in, in a while. That's of course is not easy, but consider that 24 billion euro of purchasing uh, uh, from local administration and social food service uh, in this huge market is only 2.5%, 2.2 exactly. So we will not destroy anything. If we will be able to find a new supply chain, we will be successfully also on, on health aspect. And that's an Italian research that we made the last 20 years from 96 to 2015, where, for example, we can observe that uh, this industrialization process was impacting uh, the public food service in Italy. And that's uh, is around 20% uh, of the Italian company working in the field, but we analyzed till like 80% uh, and the, the trajectory and the indicator is quite the same. So product cost, so cost of raw ingredients, both by uh, to make the service a shift from 61 uh, to 71% for the producer. This is the food processor that they are a sub, main supplier of, of public food service company. And the industrialization process raised from 247 revenue uh, uh, euro, thousand euro per worker to 686, so three times more. And the profitability of this sector, it's going down. The second slide is uh, of the middleman, we call it. It's the logistic platform is what we need today because we want to have uh, any ingredients every day of the year, cherry tomatoes every day, every day or, fray, or strawberry every day. That's uh, the craziness of the system. And here in 96, they were quite not existing this kind of company because uh, the, the, the food service market was uh, still uh, managed in a quite artisanal way. And after we grow with this industrialization wave, and also here you can see, for example, that they keep a huge part of the margin of the, of the chain. They shift from 2.4 in EBIT to 5.9 to 6, and the product cost from 86 to 79 because they, they are really buying a lot of, uh, they make economy of scale when they buy the product and they struggle the industry that we see the effect uh, before. The third one is the public food service company, is the, the private company that they are supplying uh, services to uh, cities or school canteen or BNI and hospital. And also here we are seeing that the product cost is, is reduced, the labor cost is reduced, but they still maintain uh, their uh, profitability. This last uh, slide is, is giving evidence to the trend of the margin of their earning before incoming tax during the last 20 years. The winner is the green line, that is the uh, wholesale or the so-called middleman. And we can see the uh, habit of food manufacturer processor uh, are, is going down. And the one of uh, social food service company also is going down, but it still remain, I mean, a little bit better than, than the food industry. Uh, just a joke, this is like banned before. That's uh, it's in a slide that I, I always put here because for the same uh, frame of time, 96 to 2015, uh, we also observed that in Italy, but in Europe it's quite the same, uh, the, the per capita expenditure on health, it's double. It's, we shift from uh, 1,200 to 2,500. That's, uh, there is no relation, of course, there is no scientific relation between the, this slide and the previous one. But I mean, we, sh we, we really need to, to, to investigate in a deeper way. So thank you very much. And uh, I will start to give the stage uh, to the first speaker of this uh, second round, uh, second part, that is Ms. Minna Kalyonin, with the title is Sustainable School Meal for and 
with the students. Nina, it's, the stage is for you. Thanks a lot, Maurizio. Uh, just a minute. Am I with you? And again, is the presentation also with you? Can you hear and see me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks for the economic insights on the on the meaning of the on the food service sector uh, for the for the economy, so to say. Um, I will talk a bit about the sustainability issue, but I will take a very particular angle on the sustainability, uh, trying to figure out a bit more. How do the really the, the children and the pupils and the youngsters see it? And why is it important that we should look at that, that part as well? I myself come from the Finnish Environment Institute. Uh, we, are, we have been working with Heli on these issues and, and otherwise as well. And uh, during the past years, we have also tried to with our research and very this kind of action-oriented research, try to think about the, how the sustainability issues in the in the Finnish school system uh, could be taken forward. And now this what I will be talking about today uh, is part of a big, bigger uh, Just Food project where we look at the Just Food system transition in Finland, where we see that the school meals and the food, public food services have a have a role to play there as well. Uh, but to start with about the sustainability. Uh, so that the, as also Maurizio was hinting towards that the, that the what is procured uh, for the for the school meals of course have a big impact on the on the on the agriculture on its in itself and the whole food economy uh, and as it's and is as its best it can also kind of a participate in creating a novel more sustainable value chains depending on um, because of the volu volumes, volumes in the in the food uh, and the kind of a, yeah, and this is very much also what kind of the EU policies are targeting. Uh, the in, the more environmentally um, laden EU policies are targeting school meals via this responsible public procurement and the kind of a development of practices uh, within there. Uh, the school meals can also they can have a big um, effect on the ways in which we eat, both in terms of, uh, of healthy eating, but then also environmentally friendly eating because of the, because of the, again, the big mag magnitudes, but also because it's kind of a, it's a daily um, eating routine where what they are kind of uh, delivering and, and uh, offering for the, for the students. So it's, uh, it's important both in terms of a quantity and quality. So both of these aspects should be taken into account when we think about the sustainability and how, how the school meals can address this. Uh, and as Heli was nicely telling about the, the tradition in the, in the Finnish case about the school meal programs, so also with regards to sustainability and the environmental impacts of the school meals, a lot of uh, a lot has happened uh, during the past ten years, I would say, uh, both in terms of uh, of this kind of um, uh, procurement practices, how, for example, we can better ensure the procurement of uh, of local local food and also support the local agriculture and local um, economies in this respect. But then also in terms of a more kind of a bigger impact that our diets can have uh, on, 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 on the environment. And here I am really talking about this kind of a balance between the animal-based and the plant-based uh, foods in our diets. And in the food services, there is now a great interest uh, to work towards to integrate the health and sustainability aspects. And um, many of the people, as well as our nutrition recommendations, see that the health and environment in this re respect very much go hand in hand. And the food services in practice are developing a new foods new meals, uh, new practices, uh, procedures and so forth, how they can kind of uh, uh, take, take into account the sustainability in a more mature manner in their, in their servings and in, in the planning of the, of the menus. 
So a lot of things are happening there and practical tools are being developed for taking into account the sustainability aspect as well. Uh, having said this, uh, my argument is, is actually that we know much less about how the students and the pupils think about the sustainability. Uh, and this is now something that uh, we have then tried to investigate. Uh, and I think it's very important that, uh, and I think in school meals, it's important that we understand how the, how the, how the pupils see the sustainability so that we can support uh, the sustainability in, uh, in a good way. But also I see uh, school meals as a good kind of a window to study what sustainability actually is. Uh, in the in the just food project, uh, we have uh, tried to investigate uh, the, the meanings uh, the pupils give to sustainable school meals, and we have done this with uh, multiple methods. And I also underline this uh, idea of multiple methods because I think that um, to learn about food and its sustainability and what it means. Uh, uh, very much depends on the method, how we look at it. And uh, re depending on the kind of um, angle or focus we take on the sustainability might, might, might get a different meaning. In this particular project, we have uh, used the photo voice method. I don't know if you are familiar, familiar with, that, with that, but uh, in, the, in the nutrition and nutrition studies, quite much of this photo voice kind of um, in, uh, inspired methods has been used and we have uh, asked the, the, the pupils from uh, from the schools both in Helsinki which is the capital of Finland and then also from Murame which is a more kind of a rural municipality uh, to send us to take photos about the problems that they see how they would like to see uh, climate friendly school means being developed. Uh, and they do this individually. Uh, and then we have, with these photos, we have plenty of them. We have then kind of a thematized them and uh, work them further with the groups in the schools in, in a group work so that they are kind of a, let them students to co-create their own solution to sustainable school meals. We have also organized this kind of a tasting uh, sessions uh, with the new more climate friendly uh, recipes and foods. Uh, so that the pupils have an opportunity to taste them before they are taking, taken into the menus and, and give opinion on them. But not, not only about tasting and talking about the taste and the flavor of the food, but then also integrated the information on the, on the production of, of these foods and the climate footprint of this food. And we have integrated this kind of a small competition into the tasting sessions, which is kind of a, again, gives kind of a, a balance between the different aspects of sustainability in food so that we can kind of investigate uh, what kind of a meanings it, it, it gets. Uh, the students have been also that there has been a possibility for them to cook the new recipes for school meals in the in the home economics um, lessons. Uh, this is also something that Finland has a very strong home ep economics teaching via, via which the food education very much takes place. Uh, so that we have also there is this hands-on experience on, on, on cooking in the food education. Uh, what we have learned then, what do the, the, the students then, how, the, how they then um, see the sustainability and what meanings it gets. I'd like to highlight a couple of things. Here are the kind of, a, the, the, we have clustered and grouped and uh, worked for further with the, with the solutions provided by the, by the pupils. And I uh, highlight a couple of issues of here. Uh, we have in, uh, some of some background still. So we have engaged the pupils from, uh, from, the, from the secondary, what is it? Compuls comprehensive school. So the, from, uh, I would say from 10, to 17 years old or so forth. And of course there is a, there is a different and variety depending on the, on the age of the, of the pupils. Uh, but as a kind of, um, as a key message that comes from the, from the students is that they are very much, um, they understand the, me, the, the need uh, to lessen uh, animal-based foods in our, in our eating 
and they kind of uh, promote the food services to go along the to, to go strongly towards that line and they are they are they are willing to reduce the meat consumption in the, in the school meals as well but they highlight very much that this should be done so that at the same time the variety of uh, vegetables and fruits and berries and uh, and the salad components uh, is kind of a are given greater emphasis. So this is the kind of the way ways in which um, the vegetable consumption in the, during the school meals should be uh, taken forward. So more variety to the to the food uh, to the healthy and sustainable food served, but then also more flavor. Uh, and of course, very much of the food talk with the pupils goes via the flavor. Uh, and they have a there is a lot to do with regards to that uh, in, in the school meals. But they see this kind of, um, yeah. Uh, then another thing which goes hand in hand with the sustainability is really this food environment. To have a peaceful time during the day, uh, a moment to talk with your peers, with the other pupils and, and really this kind of a better dining experience. Uh, is very much underlined by the pupils. And as Heli was hinting, so there is a tendency towards now in, in, in Finland that people are skipping, skipping the lunches. And it's, I would say it's partly because of this, um, the, the, the school meal at the moment, the, the lunch break is quite hasty. And the, the, especially during the COVID time, it, it became even more, short at the period and so forth and the pupils are really saying that it's it doesn't help if you do what you do with the served food if it's if it's not getting eaten so we need to kind of uh, work with the food environment in the meantime and i think this is the the key message coming from from the pupils that you cannot separate these two from the sustainable school meal uh, the students are, of course, also highlighting the, the, the local food uh, stuff and so forth, especially in the more rural areas. So they really saw the, the linkages, uh, what the kind of what is provided in the, during the school meal, that what it could have for the for the local food economy and, and the agriculture. And also asking for for good and um, feasible kind of a feedback. <laughs> mechanism and hearing of the students' voices in the in the development of the school meals, and they very much like this kind of a the, the, this photo voice uh, and and the group work and the tasting sessions in particular that we organized with the, with the students, and would like to see this take taking place more uh, more in school as well. Uh, so to conclude, uh, firstly about the, the, the kind of a so, solutions to sustainable school meals uh, learned from this case is really that it's uh, we need to highlight this multiplicity or the whole food whole whole school meal approach that was uh, already discussed earlier and it comes very apparent from the from the voices of the students uh, but as i said also it's kind of a we need to as as a researchers if we are to understand the meaning of the school meals for the children, uh, we need to kind of develop our methods further and use the variety of methods in the, in the study of the meanings, but also in the kind of a, in the support of the, of the, of the food education as well at, at the schools. So this is really a challenge for us uh, as we go towards the, because in, I think, I personally think that in the school meal discussion, we we look at the thing too much top down. There is a lot to be carried out and done uh, to be understood better that what this really means for those for those people who we are serving the lunches. Um, and I I would encourage us all to go go further with that. And I also want to underline that this kind of a, we need to develop the inter and transdisciplinary approaches. Um, in the development of the school meals. The researchers cannot just come be kind of outsiders of the thing, but we need to put our hands in the mud and learn, learn from the practice. And then also across the disciplines uh, so that the, uh, the environmental sciences, but also the social sciences and the nutrition 
and the education that we work uh, more together in, in understanding what the sustainable uh, school meal can also, also mean. I, I'll stop. Uh, before stopping, I want to also say that this is, um, we have been doing this together with the schools and uh, with the food services from Helsinki and Muurame and with the Thea Kortetmäki and Riina Tykkyläinen from the University of Helsinki. So my acknowledgements to them as well. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Minna. Now, uh, I see there is a question, but I see that Ellie has uh, already answered to Sylvie. Uh, we can go on, uh, on uh, um, the second speech is uh, Nicola Bricas. School is not yeah. only a place to learn, Me meals are not only food. Nicolas, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very, very much, uh, Mauricio. I will share my screen with you. I wish you can see the, yeah. the slide. OK, thank you. And, and good afternoon to everyone. And, and thank you for this opportunity you, you give me to, to give maybe more a social -anthropolog anthropological point of view of school meals. But I, I want also to deliver two main messages so that are in the title coming from both experiences. The, the first one is in Montpellier where I live and I work. And the other one is in Senegal where we work with several partners because uh, I, I just uh, returned yesterday uh, from, from Dakar where I went to take part in an exchange of experiences between those in charge of school canteens in, in Montpellier and Rufisque, the Rufisque department in Senegal very close to Dakar. Sira, through the UNESCO chair in World Food Systems, um, is at the origin of a twinning between these two local authorities. In Montpellier, we have an ambitious school catering reform project uh, that has been running uh, since uh, 2014, the Ma Cantine Autrement project, that means uh, another way for my canteen project. And this project is a combination of 25 actions dealing with nutrition, environment, food waste, education, culture, agricultural links, etc., that affect 84 schools, restaurants uh, for 126 schools with around uh, 15,000 meals per day. And in Senegal, it's, uh, it's a quite new program with uh, only today uh, 53 canteens in, in 10 departments of the country supported by a consortium of, of NGOs. Of course, uh, last week uh, we discussed a lot about the benefits of these canteens in terms of access to food for people with very low purchasing power, both in, in Montpellier and in Senegal. Montpellier is one of the major cities in France where the economic poverty rate is very high and where several thousands of children have only one meal a day, the canteen meal. And in Senegal, you can imagine uh, it's, it's worse. And uh, we had a survey that revealed that the vast majority of parents cannot afford to pay more than 100 francs CFA, that means 15 euro cents for a school meal, while the meal costs more than 300 francs CFA, half an euro. And of course, we discussed a, a lot about nutrition, about education, about uh, an education for environment, for agriculture, etc., with school gardens, for example. But both in Montpellier and in Rufisk, cooks, school directors, teachers, and politicians insisted that school canteens should not be considered only as a means to feed children. When I told them that I would be speaking at this webinar today, they insisted on passing on, on two key messages. The first one is school is not only a place to learn. School is a place where children live, where they experience social relationships, where they discover themselves and other in their affinities and differences a place where they should have fun, where they play, where they relax, especially during the extracurricular time. And the canteen 
must not be or become an additional learning time, a time that we would like to charge with new educational objectives as we do during the class. School meals must not become a new constraint time, but must remain a social and pleasure time. This is very important, even in these kind of situations where uh, we know that we have a lot of, of problems of nutrition, of, of social access for food. I can give you an example of what's happening in Fisk, where not all children can afford to pay the 100 CFA per meal. And when, where we can observe that those who can afford to pay for these meals very often invite their friends to share the meal. And for a meal prepared for 200 students in a school, very often you have 300 or 350 children that are eating the, the, the meals. And for these reasons, all the canteen managers of the country have decided not to serve the meals on individual plates, but on a large common bowl, as you can see on this picture, which is more easily divided. Sharing the meal every day in this way is a value of living together, a value of solidarity considered by all the actors I met last week as a very important concern and a priority for the school catering program. The second message is meals are not only food and cannot be reduced only to food consumption. Meals are also, as I've just shown, ways to experience social rules through commensality rules. What, I, what, what, what does that mean? If you are looking to the rules that are doing a meal, you can see that you have rules like respect of food and cookers, rules of hygiene, rules for sharing, rules for regulating gluttony, a lot of rules that are making social life. And meals is also a mean to discover and build its own and foreign cultures to understand how food is a link with other humans, with men and women who produce, process, and cook the meals, but also links with animals, with plants, with microbes, with landscapes, and biosphere. I can give you another example in Rufisk. Last week, we saw that, and we had a lot of discussion with the, with the school canteen's um, directors who said that the same dish served at school or at home does not have the same social and symbolic value. Children who eat food from the agricultural products of their neighborhood or village, of their family, do not see the activities of their farming parents in the same way. The passage of food through schools gives it a different, more socially valued status. And this is very important in a context where the profession of farmer is rather socially devaluated. Last thing, in Montpellier, there is a children municipal council made up of uh, representatives of the fourth and fifth grade classes of the city primary schools. And last month, it's met to discuss proposal for school canteens, and not only school meals, for school canteens improvement, particularly in the context of the, of the building of a new food city that will be built around a, a new central kitchen in the city. And this food city will be open to the public who will be able to come and understand how the food system works, how products are bought and arrive in the city, how they are processed and cooked, and how they are distributed in the canteens. And in Rufisque, as in Montpellier, the children express their wish to be able to see the kitchens, to see the people who cook, to better understand how it all works in order to contribute, in fact, to a real food democracy. So in conclusion, if we want to show the interest of school canteens and the interest of investing in them, 
we must on one hand study the different economic models that allow the countries to be financed in, an, in, a, in the long term. That's what we begin to do with NGOs partners in different countries in Africa and Senegal, Burkina and other countries. But we must also show that school catering produces more, much more than, than school meals. It produces social links and solidarity. It produces environment, employment, culture, and a reconnection with agriculture. And it is within a multidimensional vision of food that we must think and evaluate it. We use for that a methodology we built in CIRAD and tested with a, a multidisciplinary team in nine countries of the global south and the global north, uh, urban methodology. That is a participative workshop that aims to identify the different impact pathways of innovations in food systems, different impact on the different dimensions of the sustainability, of course, environment, social, cultural, food and health, uh, nutrition and health, but also governance. We tested it on the Macontin Autrement project, and you can find more information on, on this on, the, on this website you can, you can see on the slide. So thank you for your attention. Thanks to you, Nicolas. That's, uh, I mean, I would like to point out that uh, this is a really important, I mean, the food is not only food and the canteen is not only a place where to feed the, the young people. And I think that uh, in the next intervention with Manuel Franco from uh, Madrid, he should also highlight this, uh, this role that uh, is uh, in this huge project, uh, School Food for Change, uh, where also we are partners. So thank you, Manuel, the stage is for you. There we go. Can you, can you all see and hear yeah. me? And most yeah. importantly, can you see the presentation? Perfect, go on. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much to, to all of you. Thank you very much for the, the organizers, for the, for the invitation. And thank you, Maurizio, for, uh, for inviting me to present uh, what is a starting uh, project, um, very large project in, uh, in Europe, the School Food for Change project. And uh, I will, this is a project that is uh, very broad and uh, I will try to focus on, on, on environmental and, uh, and social uh, aspects of this, of this project. And I will try also to build upon uh, all the very interesting ideas that have come out up to the up to the moment uh, right now. Yeah, is it working? The the slides? Yes. So uh, the school food for change. What it uh, actually aims is to create a shift to both sustainable and and healthy diets by impacting. Um, children in, uh, in, in Europe. And for that, we work with uh, uh, over 30 centers in 12 countries in, uh, directly, and we will expand at the, at the end of the, of the project to other, uh, to other cities. The, the main idea is that schools are the, the fundamental educational piece uh, for, uh, for young generations where we uh, actually can develop a, awareness about food and, and promote sustainable and healthy food culture. And this is something that we, uh, the project is right now starting as, as Mauricio knows very well. And, uh, and we are, uh, we don't even have a, a web page yet uh, because we have a whole work package on the communication piece. So this is, uh, this is uh, something very, very new, uh, very, uh, um, well, something that is, we are uh, starting to build uh, on um, we are working right now on the on the definitions, which has taken us months to come with uh, with definitions that we all agree upon on what is uh, sustainable and healthy diets for uh, for changing the menus in uh, in European uh, cities and European schools. Um, as many of you mentioned, we uh, we are all uh, uh, in agreement, in full agreement, in the school food for change that uh, that the schools might be a catalyst for uh, for uh, for multi actor uh, changes, and that builds on what um, what Donald uh, explained in the in the beginning, how 
even thinking about school food systems uh, means already an intersectorial uh, effort and an intersectorial approach uh, that we have very clear in our mind in, uh, in the School Food for Change uh, project. On the top of that, and that's where I come from, um, I come from the world of epidemiology and public health. Uh, we have to bear in mind that one of the main uh, impacts that we can show from these changes is if dietary health uh, is improved, as also uh, Bert uh, mentioned, how difficult it is to change uh, anthropometrical measurements, even with large uh, interventions, but at least we should be thinking of uh, on, on dietary measurements and dietary impact, but also many of other pro possible impacts of the, of the uh, how these uh, interventions are coming into, into place. And finally, I think one of the, our visions is that children are the adults of the future. That's also something that has been repeated here uh, extensively in this, uh, in this presentation today. So again, um, I think the main, uh, the main two goals of the project uh, is, is to, uh, to, to be able to shift this, uh, these diets, uh, having a, a broad scale uh, that includes uh, canteens, but also chefs, and uh, includes uh, education, as, uh, as uh, Bert uh, uh, explained before, with canteens, and including canteens, but also classrooms, including practice and education, uh, but also providing a framework that uh, provides best practices for, uh, for, uh, for different countries in Europe. And in that sense, also very important to build, uh, bring in uh, or to bear in mind that context uh, will, be, uh, will be very important when we are talking about uh, such a large um, differences in, within uh, Europe in, 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 our, in our countries. Um, again, the School Food for Change has uh, people working on public health, people working on environmental issues, uh, people working uh, on socioeconomic um, aspects of the of the of the um, of the school meal changes, and and for that we have uh, partners over um, different fourteen local governments, for example, um, one whole provincial government, one regional government uh, in Spain, uh, different uh, networks and associated partners in different uh, in different cities. At the last piece of this four year project, we will. Uh, come to replication cities, uh, at least four cities will be involved in the health impact assessment that uh, includes uh, the cities of Madrid, uh, Milano, Umeo in, uh, in Sweden, and, and Vienna in, uh, in Austria. For that, we have uh, supporting partners in, uh, in, uh, in 12 uh, different uh, countries. And we have a, a specific piece on research, and for that I'm very uh, helpful or, or thankful uh, for seeing today and listening to um, to Donald at the beginning of the of this webinar talking about the the, the research consortium on, on, on school um, health and nutrition in uh, in interventions. Um, uh, we have a specific partners working on, on research uh, in, in, in Spain, uh, the University of Alcalá, where I work, but also in, uh, in, uh, in uh, this, uh, Stockholm Environmental Institute and, and URECAT also here in, uh, in Catalonia. Um, uh, as said, we have a whole work package that has an, uh, well, will, is working uh, right now on the communication and outreach. And uh, this is so new that we don't, uh, as said, we don't even have right now a, a, um, a, a web page or a uh, social media, but I think it's important that um, we are, uh, we as a school for, for change, we are learning more today than probably we can, uh, we can, we can bring uh, back to you because again, this is only two months old, a project uh, uh, as large as almost 13, uh, 13 million euros as already Bert, uh, um, uh, explained. And finally, I would like to uh, touch base on, uh, on two uh, specific issues uh, that, that I think are important in the, in the, in the School Food for Change uh, project. One is, the, is, the, is this triple action approach that um, in, starts, well, starts or builds on the idea 
that uh, innovative procurement is something that needs to be uh, bring into uh, into the school menus in uh, in Europe, and that already uh, has difficult presents difficulties as the different countries have different. Uh, laws and different ways of uh, bringing this um, this food procurement into place in the different uh, in the different and, and sometimes like even in Spain it's it's not even uh, the same food procurement uh, laws for the different uh, the different regions of uh, of Spain. Secondly, and I uh, again I was happy to to hear about uh, about all the uh, several of the presentations today that. Uh, um, mention and stress the necessity or the need for uh, for not just uh, thinking about changes in the in the canteen but also in the in the um, in the educational uh, pieces and also involving uh, involving the the families and that's something that uh, we uh, also have bear in mind uh, when we designed and uh, and um, and obtained this the, the funding for this for this project um and also uh, we very much um centered and thought about this uh, whole school food approach uh that is uh, that is part of this, that is uh, as a fundamental piece of the of the school food for change uh project other in uh, a specific um idea or or, uh, or, um, or characteristic of the school food for change is that we will be uh, directly uh, working with schools and uh, and children uh, that are based or that are located in vulnerable populations and I think this is a very uh, important piece uh, that um, we should bear in mind that's um, again some of you have already mentioned today when thinking about uh, food insecurity when thinking about um, how to secure that children and families at least uh, once a day uh, they get a nutritional uh, a nutritional um, valued uh, meal in their uh, in their daily life and this is something that sometimes we tend to 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 forget or, or, or tend to uh, be able to oversee and not to fully understand that even in a, in in a, in highly developed and high income countries like most of the uh, or like Europe it is, uh, we still have large proportions of the population that are uh, not only in poverty, but also in uh, under, for example, food insecurity. And uh, as, uh, as my previous colleague was talking about uh, the situation in France, the situation in Spain is actually uh, deplorable in, in terms of uh, food poverty or food insecurity, even racing uh, after the, the COVID pandemic. So this is, uh, again, something that in our design for the School Food for Change is, uh, is, uh, is fundamental. And uh, we will touch uh, and focus on those uh, schools uh, in located in vulnerable populations or underserved communities in, uh, in, in, the, different, uh, in the different countries. And this is part of uh, um, my last uh, thoughts, uh, not coming specifically from the School Food for Change, but coming from the work that we've done uh, before in uh, in Madrid, but that we also brought to the to the to this whole school uh, food approaches and to the School Food for Change when we measured the, the socioeconomic inequalities in the in the food environment around schools in uh, in Madrid, and what we found is that the um, what we did is we measured all the, uh, or we geolocated and, uh, and characterized all the food stores uh, that sell um, unhealthy foods around all the schools and, uh, and, uh, and educational centers in the city of Madrid. And what we found is that the uh, schools located in the lowest uh, tertile, or, um, lowest quintile, sorry, of, um, of um, socioeconomic status by area, those schools presented 68% more food stores uh, selling unhealthy foods and very cheap food than those located in the, in the, in the middle income areas. But those schools located in the high income areas had 40% less than the, those in the middle income. So what you have is what we call the social gradient 
of in this case of the food environment in a in a city like uh, like Madrid that this this fits perfectly what we know already uh, at least in Spain is the social gradient of uh, uh, childhood obesity for, for example that is such an important uh, piece of what is going on in our reality of public health and population health in uh, in in Spain so this is how the uh, media how the uh, uh, the newspaper El País uh, took uh, took uh, took on this on these results and on this uh, on this project because I think that most of what we do uh, should be shared with our uh, with our uh, communities and should we uh, and should we share it uh, with of course with the stakeholders with the with the policymakers but also with our population through uh, through communication. So thank you, thank you again to all the organizers, and uh, thank you, Maurizio. I'm sorry we cannot tell a lot of details of this hu huge, humongous project that is right now starting. And I said it's so new that we don't even have um, a web page or a Twitter account yet, or things things like that, because uh, this is like a. Uh, sometimes I think about this project like a like a those humongous ferries that takes months to, to go, but will cross the ocean and hopefully in four years will arrive to uh, important conclusions and important data. Thank you again. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, so we have uh, eight minutes to end this uh, webinar. So there is, uh, there is one question uh, on the Q&A. Hello, please, I want to know from those who work to change food system in school, did you measure or notice the impact in the entourage? But um, I, I, can, uh, I can, I mean, the answer is, uh, there is some uh, 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 communication agencies, uh, it was Ketchum, if I remember well, that uh, affirm and some other that uh, uh, pupils and, and, and students are uh, the new food evangelists. So they should really uh, uh, make an impact on the family decision when they're buying food. So that should be in the project uh, School Food for Change. Uh, we will measure it. We will try to measure it. But uh, as Manuel say, we, we already start so no way to, to answer to this uh, in, a, in, a, in a concrete way. Uh, there is uh, no other question. No, there is another question, maybe. Sorry. I'm a master's degree student that wants, that wants to implement the same thing in my county, Senegal. Is there a way to partner for a search? Uh, that's uh, uh, from Fatumata Sonko. That's uh, maybe for, for you, Nicolas, if you can answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there is a consortium of NGOs with with a, a World Food Program also and FAO in Senegal that is working on the school canteens program at the national level. So maybe you can have contacts with it can be FAO or it can be a World Food Program or it can be with GRDR uh, in Senegal that are that are in, in the same group uh, working on, uh, on food cantons. Uh, I, but I, I also know that the, the University of Dakar, uh, UCAD, uh, have also uh, uh, links with this, uh, with this consortium of NGOs and, and uh, international organizations. So you can have links uh, with them in order to see if they are interested by your, by your master degree um, uh, contribution. Uh, the LARTES is one of the lab of the, of the University of Dakar who is working on it. Okay, thank you. So now I give the stage again to Sylvie or to directly to Michel Dura of the World Food Program. I don't know if it's already connected. We have in the agenda. Just uh, one uh, last question before concluding this uh, second session. I would like to know if some teams uh, have already estimated the number of jobs or um, number of uh, the economic value who could be reached by implementing school meals in territory approach. Do you have an idea of this? Uh, thanks. We, we, we have some analysis and we are going deeper now with, uh, in France with the Dordogne department also to make a, a, a deeper analysis uh, to better understand uh, 
because of course, if we shift to local producer without any middleman and establishing a, 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 like a food hubs in the city, that's we, we will have the chance to create several jobs, but really several hundreds, as I say at the, at the beginning. Manuel, I don't know if you want to see, otherwise Donald does uh, arise the end. Yes, uh, just just to say that we we will we are um, working on the on the definitions and indicators right now, and we would love to to bring that in uh, in the school food for change. But again, uh, the, the the differences not only just between countries, but also between uh, uh, cities make things uh, very very complex. So, for example, the the metropolitan area of Madrid is 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 is, is a city of six million people. is the is the third largest. Uh, city in uh, in in Europe, so it's uh, very different from uh, from 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 middle-sized uh, cities or even small cities. Donald, so so I just wanted to say that the uh, the World Food Program State of School Feeding Worldwide 2020 in the survey work they that was done for that they came up with a a, a sort of scale estimate, which was 2,000 jobs created for every 100,000 children fed, um, which is not very different from the Maurizio, from the kind of scale that, that your figure was. So it, it's maybe very interesting. And uh, for ministers of finance, this is a very important figure. Yeah. That I think it would be one of the, I mean, biggest added value uh, of this uh, consortium research, mm. because uh, we, we need really, I mean, it, personally, it's almost 20 years that I'm studying uh, uh, the public food service uh, and going <coughs> deeper uh, in Europe, in China, in the US, uh, and we have a lot of connection and and and, and there is a rising uh, awareness of this and, and uh, sure many things are changed from uh, 20 years ago, uh, that's, that's clear, but we are not really yet performing this in the best way we can. We can produce better food. It's more easy, It's we can. The problem is, uh, as we love to say, is to connect different dots. We need to connect the dots and we need to create new skills also in the city. That's one of the goals also on uh, the School Food for Changes in our working packages with, to create the, the food enabler or the city food maker, as we love to say, in Eating City. We need to create new skills that they are really able to connect the different dots. We have all the ingredients on the table to make better food. We need time and research. So me, I don't see Michelle uh, Dura. Uh, did you know Bettina if it's... Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I think it is Edward uh, who is supposed to uh, say the final words from the World Food Program. Edward? Thank you. Thank you, Bettina, and thank you, Maurizio. I, um, I, my name is Edward Lloyd Evans. I am the, the head of research uh, policy uh, at the UN uh, World Food Program uh, school, fe school Feeding Division in, in Rome. So um, while Michelle is not here, um, she's asked me to speak uh, because my work is more related on, on research um, and evidence. Um, so thank you very much for having us and for hosting and convening this seminar. On behalf of the World Food Programme, it is an honor to provide these closing remarks at this important event, which focuses on this potential of school meals to reach and deliver on sustainable development goals, essentially. Um, it is very important and encouraging to see uh, Europe engage in this topic and impressive to see the various sectors that are coming together, including the agriculture sector. At WFP, we are delighted with the engagement we have now with the OECD through the Research Consortium Initiative and the Initiative on Data and Monitoring, all part of the School Mills Coalition. And I'll highlight those, uh, the work that we're doing on data and monitoring in a moment. Um, we hope that EuroAgri Euro, Euro uh, and CIRAD will participate in the research consortium with us, where I actually serve as the WFP liaison with the research consortium uh, with, with uh, Doug Bundy. Uh, today we've heard 
uh, from countries like France, we've heard from Finland, Denmark, um, we've heard uh, from examples on Senegal, uh, work that you're doing on how school meals can be used to improve nutrition and health, including knowledge and skills needed to make better choices about food. Um, from Finland, uh, so, sorry, from uh, Spain, France, and Finland, uh, Finland's, uh, the Finnish Environmental Institute specifically, uh, we've heard about how uh, promoting food systems, uh, looking at the dimensions related to awareness of food, the food industry and services in Europe, uh, how we promote sustainable and healthy food culture, including the systematic change, linkages to social and, and, and cultural solidarity, examples on, on Senegal. And I want to talk also specifically on the importance of school meals on the, on the SDGs, as I mentioned. The evidence shows that healthy and well-nourished school children, as you've all articulated, learn better. Healthy children have better chances to thrive and fulfill their, their potential as adults, ensuring that children, especially girls, stay in school and are able to learn allows countries to create human capital and individuals to more fully achieve their potential in life. School meal programs therefore contributes to achieving at least eight of the sustainable development goals related to SDG one, poverty, SDG two, hunger, SDG three, health, education, SDG four, Gender equality, SDG five, economic growth, as we've seen, um, as we're talking about the jobs, SDG eight, reducing inequalities, SDG ten, and strengthening partnerships, SDG seventeen. This is because of their impact on multiple sectors, including social protection by boosting income for households and communities, on education, helping children get into schools and stay in schools. They are particularly effective in increasing girl, girls' attendance, which in turn protect them from gender-based threats, such as child marriage and pregnancies. On agriculture, when purchasing food locally, um, these programs create stable markets, boost local agriculture, in, impact rural transformation and, and strengthen local food systems. And on health and nutrition, offering a regular source of nutrients that are essential for their mental and physical development. On-site meals, especially when fortified or supplemented, can reduce the prevalence of anemia by up to 20% in girls, as we've seen. We see uh, the work that Stefan Verguet and, and WFP and others are doing that show how effective uh, school meal programs are in the economic returns it, it, it provides across uh, sectors, be it education, health, social protection, and agriculture, where for every dollar invested in school meals yields up to, up to $9 in returns. These programs transform lives and communities. They do more than provide food. Particularly when combined with other school interventions, school meal programs can support local agriculture and markets while stimulating improving health, nutrition, and education, making communities more resilient. So I wanna talk a little bit about the School Meals Coalition, if you bear with me for, for, for a moment. WFP is very proud, the World Food Programme is very proud of having been able to support one of the main coalitions that came out of the Food Systems Summit, the School Meals Coalition. The School Meals Coalition is a government-led initiative championed by France and Finland, and including already more than 61 countries and 63 partners who are committed to the goals and objectives of the coalition. This is remarkable, considering the coalition was only launched in September last year. We're very pleased about this. The coalition's aim is to support governments and partners to improve or restore national sustainable school meal programs and strive for every child to have the opportunity to receive a healthy, nutritious meal in school by 2030. The coalition aims to do this by restoring what we had by 2023, by supporting all countries to re-establish effective school meal programs and repair what was lost during the COVID-19 pandemic. Two, reaching those we missed 
by 2030, the most vulnerable in low and low middle income countries where we were not able to reach them before the pandemic. And lastly, improving our approach by 2030 uh, in improving quality and efficiency of existing uh, school meal programs in all countries by facilitating healthy food environments in schools and promoting safe, nutritious and sustainable, uh, sustainably produced foods. However, the School Meals Polish, uh, sorry, the School Meals Coalition will only be successful if its goals and objectives are supported by a variety of partners such as yourselves. In, in this way, um, I'll talk specifically about the research consortium. The World Food Programme strategy launched in early 2020 articulates how WFP, the World Food Programme, will work with governments and partners to ensure that all primary school children will have access to good quality meals in school, accompanied by a broader integrated package of health and nutrition services. This strategy also calls for more research and knowledge sharing to improve the quality of programs. As such, we aim to stimulate more research on health and well-being as we're doing with the research consortium and partners like yourselves. As Don Bundy indicated, many publications, including the Disease Control Priorities 3, have called for research and action on ch child health, uh, but it was narrowly focused on the thousand days. And the push and, and what Don's work is, uh, is advocating for is the more holistic concern of the other 7,000 days. So not just the thousand days, but the 8,000 days from an age siloed approach to an approach that embraces children's needs across the life cycle. Over the last decade, there has been a sustained improvement in the quality and, and, and quali quality and quantity of school feeding programs delivered by governments and development partners and um, increasing in quantity and quality of research as well. But more is needed. Global gaps in the knowledge base need to be fulfilled. As a community of research and practitioners, we have a responsibility to house and make available global knowledge so that countries can use that information to improve programs and provide adequate support to vulnerable children. Two such efforts, as I mentioned, is the work that the World Food Program is engaged with, with the research consortium and uh, partners like OECD, where WFP is supporting the research with the Cochrane Review, learning adjusted years of schooling and the value for money studies uh, that, that um, Don mentioned in his, in his, in his presentation. The World Food Program is also leading efforts in a data and monitoring initiative of the School Mills Coalition, which was just launched last week as, as uh, Don Bundy uh, indicated. The data and monitoring initiative aims to improve and institutionalize the availability of quality data on national school meal programs worldwide for evidence-based decision-making, tracking of progress over time, and helping to identify the knowledge gaps for further research. Here, we're talking with countries um, and the, the variety of partners that are included in this, in this uh, data monitoring initiative include, uh, as I mentioned, the research consortium, intergovernmental agencies like the OECD, the African Union, as well as foundations and other UN agencies. The initiative is intended to become the official reporting mechanism of the School Meals Coalition to report on progress against three uh, objectives of the coalition, namely, uh, again, to, to, to build back better what we lost out of the COVID pandemic, to reach the vulnerable children, and in improving quality and, and uh, efficiency of these programs. Our collective action should be towards reinforcing and strengthening the role of research and evidence-backed uh, evidence uh, implementation of national school meals programs. Drawing from decades of engagement in school feeding, the World Food Program will support the development of global public goods, such as a comprehensive uh, database, uh, which, which will be the work of the Data and Monitoring Initiative, and will document and share global lessons learned, best practices, standards, and norms, which is part of the work that we're doing uh, with the research consortium. Um, we look forward to, to working with you as you undertake uh, the work that is already ongoing in terms of research. I thank you for all your contributions on behalf of the World Food Programs, your commitment and investments in leveraging school meals in the transition to sustainable food systems and delivering on the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Edward. I think it could not have been better summarized the whole afternoon, even today. So I'm not going to um, extend it very much. I just want to um, um, say I've learned a lot. I think the big challenges, as Mauricio said, is remains is connecting the dots also outside academia, also with our different cultures in different parts of the world and so on. Like practices is how and what can we learn from each other. But otherwise, I very much agree with, with you about the importance um, of schoolmates, not least uh, after the pandemic. And I also agree with um, the uh, situation of girls worldwide still very much uh, a problem. So hopefully this can be uh, also taken up in the wake. Otherwise, I would like to once again to thank all speakers and panelists for their time, their enthusiasm, and that they were happy to share their knowledge and insights with us. But I would also like to um, thank a few of the less visible people. That is um, Sandrine, uh, and not least Elie Daguet. These were my contact points in um, preparing uh, this, um, this webinar. They did an awful lot of work not much seen in the background. I'm sure there were other people at the Sierra who did the same. So I also thank those, um, which I unfortunately have never met. So I would like to conclude this very interesting event now. And once again, thank you very much. And um, bon courage with the <laughs> continuing work. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks to you all. Thank you all. <laughs> Goodbye. Great webinar. Thank That's you great. very much. <laughs>